involved with RSN for nearly 15 years. Support from someone who's been there makes all the difference. Hey David, what are you listening to? Kidney Talk, an online radio podcast that talks about kidney disease and the prevention of it. Oh cool, where can I find that? Oh, you can download it on iHeartRadio, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. Oh nice, I'll definitely have to download that. Shout out to Renal Support Network, the annual Renal Support Network essay contest. I won the Renal Support Network contest last year, the warrior, and we are all warriors. So thank you, thank you. Keep on doing all that you do and um, be happy and healthy and keep the hope. Thank you, Renal Support Network, woohoo! As a kidney transplant recipient, I find that having actual publication like Kidney Talk is an invaluable resource for any kidney warrior at any stage. RSN keeps me informed of kidney advocacy issues so my voice can be heard. I'm really looking forward to the prom this year and meeting people who are just like me. Dressing up is super fun and all the activities are amazing. Can't wait to see you there. Hi, I've been participating in the Renal Support Network 30 minute fitness Zoom classes. Not only have I lost 15 pounds, but I can also strike a yoga pose like this. When I created Renal Support Network back in 1993, I had no idea the impact that I would have among my peers. An illness is too demanding when you don't have hope, and peer support, education, and knowledge are crucial to our survival. We have a great week planned with some incredible speakers, uh, great uh, information for you to share, learn, so we can survive and thrive with this illness. It's imperative. So uh, stay tuned, we're going to have a great event and a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen. I am going to introduce our next presenter and that's Dr. Ferris. Uh, she wanted to be a doctor since she was six years old and um, wanted to help children feel better soon. Her siblings got tired of playing patient all the time and she's cared for children over 25 years. She's the parent of a young adult who has a chronic condition diagnosed at 18 months of age. And she learned early in her career that um, the importance of listening to parents and their concerns as their children better, they know their children better than anyone else. Uh, Dr. Ferris plans to take care of her patients as she would her own children. And uh, welcome Dr. Ferris, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the lovely introduction and I appreciate the words. Um, it's very hard to follow Lori as a motivator and speaker, but I'm gonna to try to do my best. Um, I was sure about um, a storm that was gonna pass through our, through our neighborhood, et cetera. As it turns out, the sun is shining, but I recorded this um, ahead of a time. I also wanna tell you that um, um, I knew that the audience was gonna be mixed. And while we have a lot of parents, I thought we were also gonna have some health providers. So I tried to make this talk um, for um, uh, a universal audience. So I'm honored to be here. And do you wanna get the, the presentation started, Suzette, please? And then I'll come back and answer some questions. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Maria Ferris, and I'm a professor and director of the UNC Healthcare Transition Program in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It is my pleasure to address you today and share some of the lessons from the field um, regarding this program. I know that it is only thanks to the collaboration from our patients, our families and volunteers, that we have been able to produce 70 publications in the field. We have collaborators across the US and international collaborations across the world. We have received funding from the Renal Research Institute, the CDC, HRSA, NIH, and of course from our volunteer team 
at the UNC transition team. Our mission is to teach, enhance, and promote self-management and transition readiness for patients who are 12 to 29 years of age who have chronic health, condi chronic health conditions. This is an interdisciplinary conference, and I would be remiss to thank our interdisciplinary team. We have had volunteers that come and go. Some of them continue to play with us, but as you can see, we not only like to share science, we would also like to share some meals. We founded our program in 2006, and our mission is to teach, enhance, and promote transition and self-management. We have developed and validated tools to measure the healthcare transition progress process. We serve many conditions, not just chronic kidney disease, and we have over 70 publications. The information I'm about to share with you is available on our website, which is listed below in this slide. So let's start. Why is this important and why do we talk about healthcare transition? When I started in this field, I actually was able to look at the USRDS data set with a team uh, in the NIH um, who helped me identify the, and describe the 10-year survival uh, of patients who have had end-stage kidney disease in the U.S. by incident cohort. In the blue line, you will see the cohort that was diagnosed most recently in that study, which is in the 90s. In the red line, these are, this is the page, these are the patients who were diagnosed in the 70s. There's a big difference in 10-year survival over this 20-something year study. At the beginning, the 10-year survival was about 70 percent, and then later on, almost 90 percent. If you're a transplant patient, you have a better survival than if you are a dialysis patient. Well, what is healthcare transition? It really is a process that involves adolescents and emerging adults, their parents and providers. We start around this area, but how do we get them to this area successfully? And those transitions stop, stop at the time of transfer. Transfer is different from transition. At the time they transfer to adult provider services. And what happens if we don't prepare our patients? Bad things can happen to our patients when they go to the adult focused services without preparations. In studies across the world, rejection has been described for transplant patients, death or graft loss. If you have a diabetes disease, in your young adult, you will have higher hemoglobin A1C or more disease activity if you have arthritis, for example. So it is important to do transition and to prepare them, but how do you do that? This publication from 2019 described um, uh, the view of children, of, uh, like really young adults, and their caregivers about what they envision to be um, their care and outcomes on healthcare transition. I invite you to read this publication but it's important to have them to, to read about what they describe as their immediate and current focus, like minimize fo uh, physical discomfort, and their future long-term focus points, like um, setting realistic expectations. Families of children with chronic conditions, not just CKD, have higher marital distress. Moreover, if you're a single parent, there's more levels of distress. And I know I'm not saying new things to all of us are familiar with this, right? But a patient with a, with a chronic condition, a child with a chronic condition, brings to the families great emotional, physical, and financial stresses. And what happens to the siblings? The siblings of these patients have more aggressive behavior and miss opportunities. And there is a lot of resentment about, um, from among the healthy siblings of these patients. All right, let's talk about our adolescents and young adults with chronic kidney disease or end-stage kidney disease. And we, as I, I love to bring this slide because it focuses on healthy patients. So this is a 10-year-old study that has, done, um, that has reviewed the brains of patients starting at age five and continuing until about age 20s. Most important part of this uh, slide is you look at see the difference between these young brains and the older brains in their mid-20s when they're fully loaded, particularly the frontal part of the brain on our forehead area where your brain achieves maturity. That only happens in your mid-20s. That 
these were healthy brains. These are brains that have chronic kidney disease. On the left side, this is a functional MRI, and these are healthy patients. And look at how many lights light up, to use that term, when they're doing tasks. Look at our patients with CKD. So they have less lights, so there's less activity in this, those brains. It's like being in the dark. So this may affect executive functioning. And in fact, a program that focused on solid organ transplant recipients, they, they utilized a, a transition readiness survey called RTQ. And they looked at several um, patients that have liver, heart, or kidney transplants. 65 of the 8% of the patients were married. So these are highly functional families in many ways. And even with that, there are deficits in executive function among the patients who have, and that will translate into less transition readiness. In our patients, if they were diagnosed at a younger age, those patients have more congenital anomalies of the kidneys and urinary tract. Whereas if you were diagnosed in your adolescent years, you are probably more likely to have a glomerular disease. These are different sets of families than these families. All right, audience, when do you think we, we should start the transition pro process? At age 8 to 10, 16 to 18, or in between? Pick your choice. Well, here's the answer. We should probably start the transition process at age 12 to 14 years, because that is really when you start to be more, more able to process some of the information. All right, that's when you start. When does it end? Well, hopefully not at this age, but it's certainly we need to continue a transition preparation and self-management in the adult-focused health settings. It's important to set the handoff and do a physical graduation and said, hey, Congratulations, you survived. Here's your new nephrologist, your new adult focus doctor who will take good care of you. This really helps to smooth out the process of transition. If you can, please set up a graduation program. We have created tools to measure healthcare transition, and we have created some interventions, and I will mention some of those results that we have learned using these tools, and I will also show you some of our interventions. Before I started to teach the patients about healthcare transition or about kidney disease, I wanted to learn how they prefer to learn about their health condition, either reading in a brochure, looking up information in the internet, asking a doctor or nurse or social worker, asking my parents or dietitian, asking parents or asking kids. You'll be surprised about the answer. Actually, they preferred to learn about their condition from their parents. This was an eye-opener for us. Second choice is health provider. Look at the internet. Not so much, right? And we, we, we would ask them, why not the internet? Their answer is, we go to the internet to have fun, not to learn about our health. The interesting thing we have learned also is that if patients prefer to learn about this, their health from their parents, they seem to be more adherent to treatment. Whereas if they prefer to learn about their health from their health providers, they seem to know more about their disease. This is a problem because if they prefer to learn about their health from their parents, their parents are not much better off than the kids are in terms of knowing about their disease and learning about the child's health condition. So it's kind of like the blind leading the blind. So we started to focus now more on educating the parent, not just the child. Okay. This is one of our tools, the STAR questionnaire. It's an 18 question tool. It measures these three areas of healthcare transition preparation and self-management, and it's self-administered. So you can hand it to the patients in the waiting room and see what their answers are. This is the self-administered questionnaire. We also have the transition index, where a health provider asks the questions, where transition has 10 letters, and here are the areas that we ask about. T for what is your type of illness, Rx, what are your medicines, what, what, is, what is the importance of staying in school, what is your special diet, what is insurance and how do you keep insurance, etc. We had our preconceived notion and we had an idea that the 12-year-olds to 14-year-olds could handle these areas, the 15 to 18-year-olds could handle these areas, and the people over 18 years of age 
could handle these areas and how to identify new providers. Well, these were our ideas. But what about data? So, and one more thing, we also know that the patients are ready to transfer when they get about 75% of the answers correctly. So we give these surveys once a year because the scores don't change very much. And based on our data, our longitudinal data, and this is a study that we did with 862 patients over 10 years duration, we actually have learned that our idea, this idea about what they can handle at what age, was wrong in many ways, because we learned that the 12 to 40 year olds can handle importance of adherence and how to identify new providers. Whereas look at this age of 20, and that's when they finally, they finally self-manage their disease. This is way after they've left our pediatric services. And also when we started working with the parents, we not only measure the parents knowledge about their disease. So we ask the parents, what is your child's condition? What are your child's medicines? We're asking the parents knowledge. But we also ask the child, do you think your child will be ready to transfer or transition to the adult focused services? When I started in this field, there was no society of healthcare transition. There isn't such a thing. And so, but there's, there are many investigators that needed to come together so that we could talk and not work in silos. So I created the International and Interdisciplinary Healthcare Transition Research Consortium. With this consortium, we came up with a model that could guide research and practice on healthcare transition. And in this model, we identified the individual domain, family and social support domain, the healthcare system domain and the environmental domain. We have done some of the studies, and I will show you some of the data based on this model. In the individual domain, um, we have learned that age 15, and this is Rebecca Ferris. At the time, she was my quinceañera, she turned 15. This is Alex Ferris, my son, and he was 12 at the time. Um, and this Chambelanis, all of her people that were dancing with her at her 15th birthday were also 15 years of age. But you can see the difference, the physical difference and the expressions on a woman who is 15 years of age and boys who are 15 years of age. Very different people, right? The reason I share this slide with you is to point out that age 15 seems to be the age when the skills for health skills transition go up. So if your program is limited in terms of personnel, and you can only focus on so many patients, it's a good idea to start at age 15 because based on data, they can handle information in healthcare transition preparation. What else have we learned? We have learned that the older you are, the more ready you are for healthcare transition. But what happens to those who started to be diagnosed at a younger age? Well, the patients who were diagnosed even prenatally actually know a little bit more about their disease, but they don't self-manage their disease as much. And I think it may be because those helicopter parents don't relegate duties to their patients. They've been used to managing the children's health all their lives, right? What about difference by sex? Most of the literature points out that females can han handle self-management um, and healthcare transition at a younger age compared to males, but actually, Males make their own appointments and talk to the doctor easier and faster than females in our cohorts. Females, on the other hand, can ha understand knowledge and plans to stay in school and why is that important in terms of having health insurance in the future. What about race? We have described in, again, a longitudinal cohort that Caucasians are more ready to transition compared to other races, except for, me, except for Asians. What about numbers of medications? The more treatment medication you have, the less self-efficacious you are. Of course, it is harder to manage a, very, uh, a, med a medication regime that requires lots of medications. Um, I love this picture because this reminds me of one patient that really was not interested in having anything to do with CKD was in total denial. And I suggested figure out a way to look at your medicines um, and have that container give you happy vibes. And look at this, she found the princess basket 
And um, at least when she looks at her medicines, there's some positive vibes um, about it. All right, let's moving, moving on to the family or social domain, domain based on the model we talked about. People who come, patients who come from a two-parent household found it easier to see the doctors about themselves. They felt they knew more about their diagnosis and thought that would be easier to transition to adult services. This is data based on Victory Junction Camp in North Carolina. And I want to thank our partners because a lot of our publications come from those families that have participated on their surveys. What about cohesion? If a family is cohesive, patients are more ready to transition and patients are more adherent. What about if you are a good citizen in the house and you do chores? So those patients who have a chronic condition and do more chores are more ready to transition. It's interesting, in this study, um, uh, we had asked the par parents to tell us if the kids did chores at home, and of course we asked the children to self-report, and of course there's discrepancies about whether or not the kids do chores at home, because the parents tell us that the kids let do less, less chores than the kids re re report themselves. Moving on to the healthcare domain, if you look at those patients that have Medicaid only, this is a a, a cohort of patients who only have Medicaid, those patients who have low transition readiness and have Medicaid appear to use the emergency room more and appear to be less adherent to treatment. Moving on to the outer ring of the healthcare transition model, the environmental delay domain, we looked at information by address zip code and we have learned that if there are more females in the community, patients appear to have greater transition readiness. If there is more poverty in the community, the patients tend to have lower transition readiness. So the, it's not so much the race, but the poverty that affects healthcare transition readiness. And these are patients with chronic kidney disease only. All right, now let's move on to our interventions and billing. So our program, um, uh, has developed some interventions, but most I want to mention quickly that you can actually bill for healthcare transition services. Um, there is a program, a website called uh, GOT Transition, which is the National Alliance for Healthcare Transition. And in that website, you can find information specific about billing. Let's talk about our tools. And this is my third child. This is Ted Ferris, who just turned 39. Um, and we have created this passport. This is one, it, the passport looks like a driver's license. It's a size of a driver's license and we laminate it. But this passport serves as a communication tool between patients and providers in clinic or in the emergency rooms. And this tool offers patient education. It's in their wallet and it's well accepted. In one side, we put their pictures their names, you can, you can use this and customize it to your institution. We're happy to share with you. And in the back of this passport, we give them their transition ID number, their medications, their diagnosis and allergies. We not only teach them the name of their medicines, their doses and how often they take it, but why they take their medicines, like in this case. MMF, two times a day to keep your new kidney happy. We have looked at the passport use between patients from very different sociodemographic characteristics, patients with CKD and patients with inflammatory bowel disease. They're very different. We have more diversity, we have more public insurance and less private insurance compared to patients with IBD. And look, there's no difference in having the passport at one year of age. The older you are, the more uh, sustained use of the passport there is. And our patients had to have their passports revised more often than the GI patients, particularly the transplant patients, and that makes sense, right? We have to change their treatment regime. We have learned that patients with transplant in another, in another group, the transit program, it's a multi-centered randomized controlled trial, and um, they used uh, patients um, who had a transplant and a heart transplant and they used a computer-based education module and they had a transition nurse coordinator and th there were changes in the baseline after these patients underwent this um, um, education program. 
what else do we do to educate patients about transition? Well, guess what? We use universal precautions that are in, in terms of literacy. Even if we have a PhD physicist parent, they don't know our language. They don't know medical terms. So we use plain words. We are always at eye level. We always answer questions and we use the teach back method. So we ask the kids, tell me, what did you learn today? Or tell me the, lame, the name of your sibling. And if they say Johnny, I would tell, what are you gonna tell Johnny that you learned about today? So it's a little bit less threatening that tell me what, you, what I said today. Right, and I'm also going to show you some data and our kidney clues cards. This is a picture from our ICU, a resident and a medical student. And as I was talking to the parent, the students write or the the resident writes what I was saying in the in the window. We call them kidney notes. So the kidney. Uh, this is a nice tool that we love to use, and I'm going to show you some examples. We call it the kidney clues cards. And I'm crazy about this new newer um, uh, low technology tool for teaching patients and for learning what they're learning. So this child is a 15 year old female, new onset end stage kidney disease came out of the blue with rapidly progressing kidney disease. She's about to start dialysis. She was a star basketball player. She was gonna get a scholarship in college. She was very excited about her life and bam, she gets this nasty rapidly progressing disease. I spent about three hours with her, her sister, and her mother explaining what it meant to have kidney disease and what it meant for her life. These are the questions that she had for me in these little index cards the next day. Can I die from this? Can I still play sports? Look at how important it is for her. So what can I expect when I live here? And will I be this, for the, will I be this way for the rest of my life? Look at the sibling's voice. How can this affect her family and the rest of her life? Can she still play sports? Very important for this family, right? This is her future. Will it get worse? Don't you love this? And is, is it okay to be scared or nervous? Here's another card for, an eight, for a couple of eight-year-olds. The top one you can see, is my blood work good? Is my kidney doing good? A transplant patient. Next question, can my brother come see me? Look at the things they're asking us. Important to them, right? I'm gonna translate the lower card. It says, another eight-year-old, I beat someone on purpose, I will do better next time. Don't you love this? The things they write for me. I also wanna to mention to you our self-management booklet that we have online. It's free, it's available for all. It's a low literacy teaching tool. It was designed with patients and educators input. I, one of my residents was a middle school teacher and he helped us design this. And we're testing it for effectiveness. I have to tell you that we'll be, we're preparing the manuscript, but it seems to be effective. It's called the All You Need Is Love um, Self-Management Program. And this actually spells all you need is love. And it's another story. I cannot tell you where the name came from, but it's a great name. And I love talking about this tool. It's that it, you can use at any time. We also have My Kidney Guru, which is uh, a tool that we are creating. Um, and it's an app. And they have scenarios. They have avatars. And it teaches the adolescents how to interact with the medical team. We are still finishing the, the, the tool and we'll be testing it next year. We have used another app in the past, the Planet K app and Planet T1D for type 1 diabetes app. And in this app, um, they had, um, we have resources for diet restrictions. We have resources for kidney health and medications. And I am pleased to tell you that patients seem to um, learn with, uh, with this tool based on our transition star scores and their knowledge goes up when they have used this tool. So in a very quick presentation, without giving you too much detail, I have summarized the last 14 years of our um, research life. And really it is not just my research life, it is my mission. Uh, transition and self-management is a process that should continue in adult-focused settings. Remember, the brain matures really until your mid-20s. 
and it's based also on cognition issues. Transition is related to patient, family, and health system. It's an issue of quality improvement and is vital for patient safety and survival. I would like to finalize, finish with the uh, last story. So this, I was at the pharmacy and I was picking up medications and um, the pharmacy people knew me. And this pharmacist was taking care of me and handing me the medications. And while I'm looking in my purse for my wallet, not paying attention, finally I grab, uh, he hands me the medicines, but doesn't let go until I make eye contact with him, truly. And um, he says, it is my pleasure to serve you, Dr. Ferris. And I said, oh, thank you very much. And he stops and says, wait, you don't recognize me, do you? And of course, I was embarrassed. And I said, should I? He said, Dr. Ferris, I was your patient. And now it is my pleasure to serve you. So this is a transplant patient who is now a pharmacist. And I hope all of my patients, I wish all of my patients would have such opportunities. I know it's not possible, but we need to strive to do that. Thank you so much. I, now it's time for us to probably ask questions and I'm going to try to stop this recording. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, I really like what you said about knowing your medications for kids because, um, or even adults. Um, we got a prescription the other day and um, my husband took a look at it and thought it was wrong. My daughter, who's the kidney patient, looked at it and realized it was the wrong medication in the bottle and it was for erectile dysfunction, not oh. immunosuppressant. So that would have been a major problem if she had not um, contacted the pharmacy and let them know that she had the wrong medication. So right. really appreciate um, what you have to say. And I think, was there any questions, Lori? I didn't see. Um... So, so one of the comments, while well, questions come in, one of the comments I wanted to dwell on a little bit more is to bring back to what Lori was saying about, uh, in what you were saying, um, about Carol, about someone making a comment to you about treating the patients as you would, raising the patients as you would a healthy child. And it is so important for us to not be permissive as parents. And I didn't go into parenting styles and how parenting styles affect the way for children to manage their disease. But we do know, not just in our data applications, that if you are a permissive parent, um, your child will not learn to manage their life and their health just as well. And if you are an, uh, an authoritarian parent, um, it is likely that the patient is, uh, follow, is very adherent to treatment. But if you are, um, uh, and I don't care parent, that's the worst kind of parent that you could have. We have to tend to our parents' own anxiety and depression, grief, uh, feelings that you have, the moment of diagnosis. We have to be mindful of those parents who have children that were diagnosed before the babies are born, prenatally. You know, these are before they even hold their babies, they're already in grief. So if, um, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, makes a lot of sense in terms of chronic conditions. Um, so um, I hope I was able to um, help um, some of the parents in the audience and some of the social worker and other providers think about healthcare transition and how this continues through the patient's lives. There was one comment when it was on the screen for the passport and someone said, this is a really great idea. So <laughs> that was great. Thank you. That, 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 that's a great idea. It, it, it evolved over time. It used to be a one page and it was, uh, they know nobody, nobody carried it. And then we folded it in four and it really truly looked like a passport. Nobody carried it. The minute we made it a driver's license, the 12 year olds love it because they don't have a driver's license, but it's their ID. Mm -hmm. And I wish I, I'm going to share one, one funny story about medical, but two stories twice, twice this happened and you cannot write about this. Um, <laughs> Elaine will appreciate this, but it was two patients who um, 
both did the same thing at different years. They were stopped by the police and they pulled their um, driver's license, their wallet, but they pulled their their medical passport and hand that to them before the uh, driver's license. And, Oops! And the police notices that. And of course, they got away with a warning instead of a ticket. <laughs> How do you report that? <laughs> My little criminals. <laughs> That's great. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, if anyone does have any follow up questions, please use that chat or the Q&A button and um, we'll pass them on and get answers to you. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.